Sophie Burnham, the author of The Art Crowd, the very controversial, very probing, very excellent book on contemporary art and who controls contemporary art. She formerly was a curator and filmmaker at the Smithsonian Institution and uh, is at work on another book in Washington, D.C. called The Land of Gentry. Welcome, Sophie. Nice to have you here. It's, uh, your, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you. I'd like to open, if I might, with a, about two paragraphs from your book, The Art Crowd. Sophie Burnham writes, one day a sculptor, Mel Bachner, walked into the Biker Gallery on East 81st Street in New York, dragging his level, dejected, despairing. He was greeted by the gallery director. What's wrong? You look so sad. I've just destroyed a work of art, said the artist, leaning heartsick against the wall. I spent three days creating it, and I just destroyed it. It seems he had been asked to enter the Whitney Annual. He was a minimal artist, and he had drawn one line at the base of a wall. That was his art. That's why he was carrying the level in his hand. Then the museum had put a Bob Loeb sculpture in front of his line, and he objected. He took it to the highest museum official he could find. What are you trying to do, he protested. Don't you understand? You asked me to exhibit. Then you put another piece right in front of my sculpture. How can anyone see it? We clucked our tongues. It's bitter to see a man so brave, so sad. How did we ever get in that condition, Sophie? That, that was a funny story, wasn't it? That was hilarious. It was real, too. I, he was, it was not. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was. And that's and, maybe and you, it, it's a funny story, but, but that artist was just as dejected as Rembrandt if he had been told to destroy the night watch. He, he really felt it. And I don't know how we got into that stage of minimal art, if that's the question you're asking me. Yeah, how, how did we, how did art ever... ad nullum. <laughs> how did art ever reach the point where any, anyone of, of any uh, persuasion could consider a single pencil line, presumably drawn with a level one foot above a museum floor on a wall as, as a work of art? Are we in a state of uh, artistic decay in our time, would you say, that we have reached that point? Oh, I hope not. I just hope not. But maybe it's just a phase that you go through. But don't forget that that's just a logical progression from the single line that uh, Newman was painting on a canvas. It was just that his line was on a wall instead of a canvas. Therefore, it couldn't be sold. Therefore, it was truer and realer and more honest, uh, more artistic. Weren't, weren't we at a low ebb it even was, when Newman was doing it? It well, I don't know. It depends on whether you wanted to buy, to buy mm. paintings for investment and be able to sell them. The fact is that Newman's were selling for a hell of a lot of money. And then if you assume that the value of the picture in its monetary terms has some relation to the value of the picture artistically, then you had to assume that Newman's line was real. And you could see it in a museum. You could go right down to the Museum of Modern Art and see it hanging on the wall. And then you could say, wow, $30,000 or $60,000 or however much that line cost that day. Gee, it must be great. And <laughs> that's right. And so why wasn't his line on the wall, Mel Bachner's line on the bottom of the wall? Why wasn't that just as real? Right? Well, well, now, the well. fact that, that I don't think it was and that you don't think it was, I didn't see his line, of course. Maybe it was. Maybe it was a the, real $30,000 line. Yeah. But, uh, the, the real question became, was the value of the piece of art reflected in the monetary value? Was the price you paid for it a price related to the art? Or exactly. was there something else that was at play there? Obviously, there was a lot at play there. Would you like to give us a clue, a hint, as to what was at play there? Because it certainly wasn't aesthetics. Uh, the subtitle of your book, The Art Crowd, is the what is it, the few rich and or powerful figures who control the art world? Something like that. Something like that. To tell you the truth, I forget it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, who, who are these powerful people, and what role do they play in making that line, or Barnett Newman's line, assume such aesthetic and monetary power? Because it is a dominating aesthetic, even though the aesthetic, in my opinion, is completely hollow. Uh, I'm not quite You sure read the Tom Wolfe book, didn't you? Yes, on the, yes, the uh, painted word. Uh, yeah, 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 which is just beautiful. Yeah, I thought he hit the nail on the head. Beautiful thing, yeah. yeah. Well, the people are 
all of the people who have to do with the work of art after the artist has created it. The artist creates his, his work and then sends it out into the stream, and the stream consists of the dealers and the critics, the museums and the collectors. And those four people, each one having his own purpose for the piece of art, create a market. And it is in this very nebulous, very uncertain shifting pattern of four different types of people all moving around that your market values are set. For example, there, how, there, wait, I just yeah, want to okay, say one so, more thing. There yeah. is still, I know, an art investment report that comes out every month, the way the Wall Street Journal comes out with its stock quotations. And this art investment paper that you can subscribe to will tell you what is a good investment in art and what isn't, what you should put your money into and what you should sell. And they treat it the way you treat a uh, horse that you buy at auction or a, a, any, a any, kind of, any kind of money-making commodity, whether it's dogs for a horse show, I mean dog show, breeding dogs, breeding horses. I've got a nice basset for you. Uh, <laughs> That's right. This German is a champion Shepherds basset. His mother was so and so. Yeah. His father yeah. was so and so. Yeah. This is a champion painter. His father was so and so. And I happen to know that he was in such and such a collection. That's the same thing. You give a pedigree, and that pedigree means that it's real. And uh, which really comes up to the fact that people really don't look at the work of art as a work of art in uh, responding to it either emotionally or enjoying well, it. Well, no, I won't they say that. No, really. I, don't, I won't go as far as that, because I think there really is an, an enjoyment of a work of art. Um, now, the, the fact that one person enjoys it and another person doesn't is difficult for us to believe in. We, we all like to think that if we can only raise ourselves up to the highest consciousness, we will understand that line on the wall. Or we, and so therefore we say it's a matter of training and going to school and training my eye. If I just see enough, I will understand. I, w I too will fall down in religious ecstasy before this new Madonna. The other thing that we like to think is that it doesn't have anything to do with money. But when a collector has just plunked down $60,000 for a picture, he jolly well likes it. You know, I mean, well, he must first like of it all, because it costs six. That's a, right. Uh, that's right. It costs how much it costs to how much you like the picture. That's right. There are people in the world who will never buy the cheap product because they know that it's not the right thing to buy. If you're going to spend your money wisely, you buy the best. You buy a Mercedes Benz and instead of a Ford. It, that's that? right. Instead of a Volkswagen, and you're happier. And the fact that you spent. Twenty or thirty thousand dollars, or if you bought a Rolls Royce, more, um, you get a lot of satisfaction out of it. You get an aesthetic pleasure out of looking you at that car. Really cool, uh, Rolls Royce, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And when your Rolls Royce increases in value, as it often does, or your picture, your de Kooning painting, or whatever it is, increases in value, and you see that your aesthetic taste was reinforced, was proven right, you get even more pleasure out of it. Because and the collector who buys it from you, who knew, knows that you paid only 60 and he's buying it for 120,000, he's getting that same amount of pleasure that you got when you bought it for 60. Yeah. And it just keeps on rolling along like that. So but that, that doesn't sense. mean, I'm laughing at it a little, but it doesn't mean that there may not also be some aesthetic enjoyment. Will the next generation enjoy the picture, or the generation after that enjoy the picture. Of course, enjoyment has nothing to do whatsoever, really, does it, with the, uh, speaking in terms of ultimates, the ultimate value of the picture, whether it turns out to be uh, the Rembrandt of its generation and so forth. It may, it may turn out to be a, a, a uh, well, I'm going to use a sort of a, uh, I'm, I'm searching for a word, but I'm going to say it may turn out to be a piece of trash, aesthetically, that at a given moment in time is revered for whatever reason, maybe mm -hmm. the values that society holds or something, and then succeeding generations see through the hollowness of what that age was after. And of course, they're going after their own thing. But therefore, the essential value of the picture is 
deduced as not really having too much. I'm trying to think back historically yeah, know. in terms of some academic painters or something we're thought highly of, you know, at a given time and then there. Yeah, well, yeah. Del Sarto or someone like that. Andrea Del Sarto, who's all those soft little lambs and soft, soft charcoal Madonnas, which some seemed, of the French academics which so. seemed <clears throat> a little... Um, saccharine. Yeah, something. saccharine, exactly yeah. the word. Yeah. But, well, I believed when I started this book that there was an aesthetic value and that if I only understood it, if I could only learn it, I would, I would come to the kernel of wisdom about art, right? That there was, there had to be a real truth. That's, so what, the artist, that's what the artist was doing, after all. He was looking for a truth. And if I didn't see it in what other people told me was great art, it had to be because I had not seen the truth and that I had to study more and learn more and so on. And I now have developed a different theory, which is that there is a truth for each age, for each generation, depending on that generation's time. It's so banal a thing to say, you know? No, but it's very um, true, I think. Yeah. We all get exactly what we deserve, and we happened to deserve what happened to art in the 1960s. So and, and yeah, that's yeah. Just, just the way it was. Now, you can't look any further than that. And the cycle goes up and down and up and down. And the art that is revered today is, is, the, uh, is sold in, in the junk houses tomorrow and then is rediscovered as a great treasure later on, yeah. Yeah. except for those few which are preserved in the museums in one generation. And we're all told forever and ever and ever afterwards that those are great works of art. Now, no one is going to deny that they're great works of art because everybody has something at stake in them. <clears throat> I don't know whether they're great works of art, but they're certainly our heritage by that time. And whether they're great works of art or not is uh, no longer in question. It seems you know? as if in our own time we've been suggest subjected rather to a great deal of the emperor's new clothes syndrome. You oh, know, I think in, we have. In terms of what, and we've been so gullible yeah, about and, it too. And we've just been admiring the the embroidery and the uh, beading on the, these invisible, non-existent clothes that these are the artists and the dealers and so forth have been parading as uh, very significant things. And, and it comes down to it's been a bunch of these little lines, these these naked nothings prowling around masquerading as art too. Well, don't artists. forget though that one thing that was interesting with the artists, the minimal artists at that mm. period in the late 60s and early 70s, that single line across the bottom of the floor. Remember that that started out as a protest against the very thing we're talking about. It started out with the artists making fun of the collectors and somehow the market turned it around onto the artists so that they discovered that no matter how much they ridiculed the collector, no matter how much they created ugly art, garbage hanging up in cellophane bags. Do you remember the garbage in cellophane bags? Well, there have been so many varieties. It would be bought. <laughs> and once it was bought and people said, you're a great artist. <laughs> you did that cellophane bag. You are fabulous. <laughs> and, and suddenly his perception of himself changed. And he believes it. And, well, there's always that sneaking doubt. Maybe he is fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's hard to know where the joke yeah. really ends. Because it kept on going back and forth. Well, this has happened, I guess, off. I, mean, I guess the, one of the early manifestations was Dada, wasn't it? When the urinals were exhibited and so forth. And it yeah, was really sort yeah. of a kick in the teeth, and everybody loved it. You know, the more teeth were knocked out, the better off. That's right. And artists have always yeah. done that. Michelangelo was no easy person to get along with. But again, Andy Warhol is a genius. He has got a queer way of thinking. He, there is no question movies, that he's. I, do you think? Uh, I mean, to talk. Everybody talks about his soup cans, but you can talk about. Oh, I think they're or very, they, very boring to look at. I don't think but there's any sense of artistic structure in terms of form or anything. No, they're, they're, they're very, like very dull. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the man doesn't have an incredibly complex way of thinking. And that's what was being bought there. That's rather confusing, isn't it? When supposedly art is the issue, when we're buying a, a complex uh, statement id or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <clears throat> it is. You come right down to the question of what is art. 
Well, it may, maybe uh, I, I don't want to avoid the question. I, I think I, I know for myself what art is, but it doesn't agree with what everybody else thinks it is, at least during the present time. But, but I'm wondering, what, what role have uh, the dealers played in this to, to get down to some Down specific, to specifics? Yeah. Well, the role of the dealer is very simple. The role of the dealer is to sell art. It's exactly the same role as any shopkeeper. That's just what he is. He's a shopkeeper. His business is to attract people, come in off the street, buy art. Or if he doesn't attract them coming in off the street, because most people don't come in off the street to plunk down $30,000 if you're high art, then he has to attract them from his list of clientele. And he does it by salesmanship. He just has to sell it. Bookstores sell and, and uh, publishers have to learn how to sell and clothing retailers learn how to sell. And what they do is sell by rarity of this item. You are buying a rare work of art, one of a kind. You mentioned that charm is, is a basic ingredient. Charm is that. absolutely the most essential ingredient. The most <laughs> essential, because, because you can't sell anything if you're not charming. And, and since you're not dealing in a commodity that can be tested except in the marketplace, it's not like the law courts where a judge of appeals will eventually come around and put down another decision and then the everyone will delay, believe that decision. There is no court of appeals. There's no Supreme Court of Art. So everything depends on charm. And he bolsters the shaky aesthetics and, in, and the... But he believes it. The very best dealers believe it, too. Whether it's true Obviously. or not, they believe it, right? Or am I... Or oh, am you I are getting, cynical. Am I getting cynical? No, it's the way... <laughs> yes, you are getting cynical. It's the way an Italian, when you go to Italy, an Italians tell you how beautiful you are and that they're in mm, love with uh, you and will you marry yeah, them. Yeah. You have to believe them because in the instant that they say it, they really mean it. Yeah. Now they will turn around and say it to, to the, the next, next girl <laughs> immediately. But that doesn't mean yeah. they didn't mean it when they said it to you. Yeah. And it's the same thing with a dealer. It's exactly the same. He truly believes it when he says it. What, what, what is the relationship of the dealer with the critic? Are they, are, is there any uh, oh. teamwork involved there? Is it a, uh, uh, is there any, is it a... Teamwork is, or? teamwork is too strong a word because teamwork implies again this knowledge of what they're doing one of the things that i found in writing this book is that is that the people had on blinders the critic went about his business the dealer went about his business that all of this other stuff was going on around him which they dealt with very capably but none of them accepted the fact that they were committing these acts or doing these things the dealer of course is charming to the critic and makes him uh, calls him up. He gives him commissions sometimes to write catalogs for his show. And one of the interesting things is you'll never find a dealer who's written a catalog for a large dealer, a large gallery, knock that show. <laughs> it's very odd. Is, is that like junketing or something? You feel somebody pays your trip it's to like, France, say, to uh, look at a movie set, a movie in operation, and then you feel sort of an obligation? Yeah, but the critics to, are generally bought much cheaper than a trip to France. Oh, they're, they they're, um, they can be bought by a picture. They go to the artists and they ask for a painting, and uh, and they see nothing wrong in taking the painting that the artist gives them. They don't consider the painting a commodity, a piece of of a of, of property that has a value, and they forcibly put out of their minds, in the curious way that people can, not see things, the stop think. They do not see, refuse to see, that anything they say in praise or criticism of the artist is going to affect its value in the marketplace. Now, they know it way down deep. They know that when they praise such and such an artist, the dealer is going to leap out and raise the price by a couple hundred dollars. And, and Xerox his it. article and show it around yeah. to the collectors and yeah. say, you see, you see, such and such a critic says so and so. And they won't, except one or two very astute and sophisticated people, take cognizance of that. Then they build up their own collections. And uh, I'm not saying that they intended to make money on their collections, but it turns out very often that the collections do end up 
uh, being worth a great deal of money. They exhibit at the museums. Harold Rosenberg, who's the critic for The New Yorker, put on a whole show at a museum in New Jersey. I forget where in New Jersey. Uh, of his own of collection? The, of his collection, every single picture of which mm. was given to him by the artist. Every single one. He bought not a single painting. May I ask now, how? Now, this is Hans Hoffman's you're talking about and things like that, of, of enormous value now. And as he points out, they were not of value when he took them. But the point is, he did. did is he one who would ask for them? What, what, under, I what, don't know if Rosenberg would, would ask for them, or story, they would be given automatically. Hopefully by the artist that he would be reviewed favorably at a later well, date. Well, artists, artists don't come up to me on the street and say, gee, I love your looks when you take my picture. Not a single one has ever done such a thing to me. Well, judging and from so, your book, um, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't come as a complete shock to me. <laughs> So, well, when he starts handing out his pictures to everybody on the street, then I think it's all right for him to include his critic friends. And uh, at the time that he is, he is discriminating against everyone else and handing his pictures out to critics or, or uh, freebies to people that are going to do him good, I think he's very suspect. Now, the artists that I talked to all understood what was happening. They all understood that this was a bribe and that it was expected. And, and they writhed under it. Have you ever been asked for a bribe in this sense? No, I've, uh, no, I've been more or less ignored in the sense that nobody felt that they needed to bribe me. <laughs> <laughs> really, to be perfectly honest. They weren't worth, worth a bribe. They weren't even. worth a bribe. But, uh, yeah, well, I, I you see, there's a certain the satisfaction, psychology. therefore, in, in being asked for the bribe. Yeah, right. It means you're at a certain level. That's of right. And you better do it. Certain, well, that's the whole point. You had better do it, mm -hmm. just in terms of the sheer business aspect of your career. That's right. Because it is such a terrible struggle for the artist to make the breakthrough. You have a very interesting section in your book on. Uh, some of the trials and tribulations that artists go through, uh, oh, yeah. handing out slides. Uh, one example, you have a young fellow come in, and the, he doesn't know the gallery director, who's a woman, and from the personnel exhibited here, I can almost guess who she is. You didn't name her. But um, she stands, she stays in the gallery, and the, her assistant tells the young man that, I'm sorry, the director's not here, but he persists. And he stays, and he stays until it's 6 o'clock and 6.30, and finally she is forced to See him? And yeah. then she takes this token of flipping story. through the slides, which represent presumably his, his work, his exactly life. His total commitment you know, to life and to his art. Mm -hmm. And she just, in a cavalier fashion, just throws them off like this. And says, there, I looked through them. Yeah. Now we can go. Yeah. It, how, how does the artist just a, break through uh, this facade of indifference or just God absolute knows. really kind of brutality God in a knows. sense? Certainly a lot of luck. I, I, uh, you can't discount luck. He's got to have friends. He has to have people who will introduce him to people. I don't mean he has to have rich friends. I mean he has to have come to the attention of someone else, presumably, and best of all, is another artist who is already making it and who will introduce him around. Uh, and one presumes at that point that there is a certain uh, justification in it. I mean, that, that the older artist is indeed taking on this protege because he's good. And there has to be some goodness in the world, and let's assume that that's, that that's, that's really it. Yeah. Uh, that's the very best kind of introduction. And then an artist will introduce them to his dealer friends or to the staff of a museum, and pretty soon he's considered all right. He's considered one of the yeah. Old crowd. Then he's, yeah, the crowd. and then he sort of picked up, begins to make mm -hmm. it. You mentioned, but it is rugged. Yeah, yeah, folks, it's rugged, <laughs> all right. You mention uh, so many specific names and so many specific incidents in the book, dealing not only with critics, with artists, with collectors, dealers, museum people, trustees. What? Uh, two part yeah, my lawyer made me take out a lot of the names. <laughs> the did? book you really want to read is the one that I couldn't write. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that's an office <laughs> good book. If it's any more uh, uh, 
I, I couldn't imagine it being any more direct and, and honest than the published one. How, how did you, what, 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 have, what was the, the reaction that you received personally to this book, and, and what were the, how did you protect yourself from libel, or were you subjected well, to Well, no, um, first I took it to a lawyer before it was printed. Um, you know, when, it, when I handed it in to my publisher, at that point, I was sent over to a lawyer with the manuscript in hand, and the lawyer and I went over it page by page and word by word for about two weeks, an expensive little undertaking, too. <laughs> and uh, she was terrific. It was a woman lawyer. She was a very good editor, and she would sit there and say, now, how can you say that? Do you really want to say that? I understand. Would it work if you used such and such a word instead? No, I would say. I'm dying to say it this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I didn't. And then I would say, what is the, what is the uh, ruling? And she would say, it's not libelous in a court of law, but you would win on this one. But it could cause trouble. And I would say, well, we'll leave it in, or we'll take it out. Yeah. Lots of them I left in, lots and lots. Some she, some she made me take out. Some I just took the name out but used the story. Um, then there was, as you said, this tremendous flap uh, when the book was printed, which surprised me. I expected it to fall like a rock into the ocean of publishing and never and be heard a, from. A, not even a, a ripple. Yeah. And, mm. uh, and it was completely <clears throat> stoned by everyone in the art establishment and joyously received by anybody who was not in the art establishment. And I think it was those people writing me and telephoning me that kept my spirits up because the, because the other was really very cruel, very, very hard on me. Um, Clement were... Greenberg, the critic, wrote me hate letters. And I have them all, actually. I had, one of the things that the lawyer made me do was to take the chapters in which I talked about John Canaday, for instance, mm -hmm. or Clement Greenberg, yeah. and take them to the person and have him read it right there in manuscript form. And so I did that, and, <clears throat> and uh, Greenberg, with his own pencil, put in additions or subtractions, and we talked about the thing. And so he could not sue me for libel. He had seen every word before it was printed. There was no way that he could sue me. Was there any kind of form and he signed or released? No, or they're in his own handwriting oh, as these pencil yeah. changes. Yeah. And, uh, but on the other hand, he was incensed. I suppose he felt tricked. And he wrote oh. me these hate letters, as I say. And he writes on, on letter paper that he's picked up in various places around the world, like the Orient Palace Hotel in <laughs> Tokyo. <laughs> and beautiful letter paper, yeah. wonderful letter paper. And then he put, he put wildlife stamps all over them. And on mine, he was putting snakes and toads and mushrooms and <laughs> toadstools and frogs. And he would say, people like you die of cancer and things like that. They were really? true hate letters. Oh, and that okay. shook me up some, too. Well, I, I don't think anyone But I guess I wounded him. him. Well, I think you, um, you must so have, it, but the thing, so the thing it was, is, uh, that he has been this tremendous power in the art world. And if I could uh, briefly read again from page 152 of the art crowd about Greenberg, when you bring it up, <clears throat> you describe him as the kingmaker. His power over artists, collectors, and dealers derives from the fact that everyone believes in his power. Galleries follow him. Museum curators pay attention to him. Artists cling to him. Collectors watch him. And this is due not only to his famous eye, that critical sensibility which even his enemies admire. It's also due to the strength of his convictions. Uh, you've, you, you sort of, he, he's, he's been an oracle in a sense. Mm -hmm. and, and he has. And, and he was one of the people most mm. anxious to go to an artist and ask for a picture and could take a picture. And then he would sell it because he was not a rich man. Often sell okay, it. Uh, Sophie, we, we are coming to the end of the show. It's, it's been far, far too brief because you've said so much in your book and, and I think accomplished so much in airing some of these problems. I, uh, I really think that the, your book, The Art Crowd, is, was an epical achievement and, and really will be a landmark in time when I think more profound values are established in art and we move somewhat away from the artifice and fashion that is 
dominated the art of our time. Uh, we've been talking to Sophie Burnham, author of The Art Crowd and the forthcoming book upon which she is working, The Land of Gentry. This has been Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>